Okay, thanks for joining us for our webinar today, everybody. Um, I'm Kaylee Howarth with Marigold Library System. Um, on the little tool control panel that you have there on your screen, likely on the right hand side, there is a section called questions. So if you have questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to use this. It's like a chat box um, to put your questions in. And as we go through the presentation, um, any questions that appear in that chat box, I will relay to our presenter and he will be answering them throughout the presentation. So let's go ahead and get started. Mark, over to you. Thanks, Kaylee. Uh, thank you everybody for attending. Uh, I appreciate that you're taking some time out of your day for this and my appreciation as well to the Marigold Library System for putting this investment into their people. It's a huge deal when an organization does that ongoing training, the opportunities for staff improvement, and I hope everybody finds a little something uh, to take with them out of today's presentation. So today we're going to be talking about patron experience and how it's more than just customer service. Uh, once upon a time, customer service strictly sort of ran the ground of what happens to the patron once they're in the door, how they interact with staff, and then when they leave. It didn't take into account all the other things that the patron literally experiences while they're there with you. Uh, so I'm going to touch on some of that today. Before we begin, uh, I'm going to get talking a little bit about where I'm coming from. Uh, I'm a system circulation coordinator with the Okanagan Regional Library out of BC. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about who we are uh, and a transition that we made that started with a leadership change that led to a mindset change throughout the system. Um, I truly believe that our team are rock stars and how we encourage this to happen, how we train them, how we continue to support them in doing that. Now, similar to you folks, I believe you've got 36 or 37 different locations. We've got 29 branches. Uh, we've got 29 different communities but we try to have one common level of service and want to know at the end of it all, what is the payoff? So we were established back in 1936. We serve an area approximately about the size of Ireland. So we're actually just a little bit bigger than you guys, uh, serving a similar population. We're at 370,000. You guys are at about 300, just over that, I believe. Uh, we've got 105,000 active patron accounts, and on our team side, we've got 173 full-time or full-time equivalent team members. So it's a pretty big organization that has a fairly large footprint. So there's a few different challenges that come up in that, similar to, I believe, what you guys experience out in Marigold. And as I said, we've got 29 very distinct branches and communities. Uh, we go from Golden all the way down to uh, Osoyoos at the border. We've got uh, BC's third largest city. We've also got city uh, towns of about 600 people in there. So it is a very uh, wide array of communities that we serve, uh, not unlike yourself, I'm sure. So if we take a look at what my role in the system is as the system circulation coordinator, there's a couple pages to the job description. Uh, it's got system training, recommending policies, procedures, assisting patrons still, uh, building maintenance, leadership guidance, periodic scans of other branches, other systems. Uh, there's a whole lot in there. But what I boil it down to, and what I can actually boil down all the jobs in our system to be, is I do what I can to make it possible for our team and our patrons to have the best possible experience they can while they're at the library. From CEO down to our van driver to the pages that book, uh, put the material away, that's what everybody's goal should be. Make it possible for our team and our patrons to have the best possible um, experience while they're here. So how we did things in the past, I will admit we are historically late adopters. We are behind the ball, still in a couple ways, but we are getting much better. Uh, we were pretty late to the party with media. Uh, we still had cassettes and VHS until a couple of years ago, and we were way behind on getting feature films. Other branches 
other systems were, were well ahead of us. Um, we had a very heavy circ and reference focus, very little programming other than our youth services team, which did some fantastic stuff. But that was the bulk of it, except for a couple of book clubs and the occasional author talk. In our larger branches, we had a segregated service model. Uh, it was very circulation versus ref. We had a position called a circulation assistant that did not do any ref. Uh, if somebody came in wanted to request a title, they would be able to do a title level search only. Anything beyond that, it had to get referred to our reference department and REF could not do any circulation. So there was a lot of frustration for our team members that worked in the smaller branches where there was another position called assistant community librarian where their hands were untied. They were able to do a lot more of these different tasks. Uh, we also had a disengagement between our frontline team and our management team. Um, the frontline team were of the understanding that management A didn't care B, weren't aware of what was happening, and C, just wanted to, to do their own agenda. And part of that was that geographical spread that we had. Because when you get out to our more remote branches, there was a feeling that either A, management didn't know we were there, or B, we know what we're doing, management, please leave us alone. And I'm sure that there's some people out there that feel the same way. Training-wise, there was no standardized training between the branches. We would have, each branch would do their own training. So people were getting various amounts of training in various branches. Then they would go on college auxiliary to different branches and were getting different information in each of the different branches they would go to. So it was horrible for our auxiliary and for our new team members starting off. And we also had the same people on every committee. So the same four or five voices would get heard, and then the other 24 branches would feel like they didn't have a voice, didn't have any input at all in it. So that's how we were in the past. The spark of change came. Uh, we had a position of a public services manager. It became two different public service director positions, one handling the north, one handling the south, and each with a different aspect of service. One was doing patron experience, the other one doing uh, partnership and programming. We hired a new CEO, Steph Hall, who came on and did a fantastic job of really turning us around with how we looked at what we were doing. And she brought in the, the feeling of a fuzzier, gentler library. So we wanted to be a lot more patron service oriented. Um, and one of the things she did with that was really encouraging staff to be more flexible with things like late fees. Uh, really sort of taking the handcuffs off of why we can waive fines, really doing it a lot more in the name of customer service. Uh, without a huge impact to the library's bottom line, we're a big organization, we've got a multi-million dollar budget, getting that two dollars if it hurts a customer relationship is not worth it in the end. Uh, the new position of the system circulation coordinator was created to help start filling in those gaps in training and the service ethic. We got a better connection between our frontline teams management and the library board. For the first time, uh, frontline team members were able to go and present to the library board for policy and procedure changes. Uh, we did that when we went to an access card program for our patrons that are in between permanent housing um, so that they're now able to get a library card and access fuller service than they could before. Uh, Mark, and, I'm just going to interrupt for a second. We have a yeah. question here. Somebody's just wondering what the two positions were. Uh, how the public service manager became two right. positions? Right, two positions, yeah. yeah. What? So it was one person covering all public service for all 29 branches. And what they did was they split that into two public service director positions, one covering uh, Kelowna and South, the other one covering North of Kelowna. So they split our region geographically. And on top of that, they also divided up some of the tasks that each would do. One was now in charge of partnerships and programming, and the other one became in charge of public service. 
um, so the more hands-on patron experience in the branches. So let me know if that didn't answer it, and I can go into a little bit further detail. Um, and then the big thing that came out of the spark of change was our new strategic plan. Uh, we started back in 2014, um, and we did some stuff that we hadn't done before. We surveyed all the communities, library usage. Uh, our teams had a lot more input on this. We brought in Ken Roberts, who some of you may know, uh, who really helped us flesh out our goals as an organization to see how we could start to meet uh, the needs of our community and where we wanted to be as an organization. And there were four key themes that came out of that. And where I live is our strategic theme uh, number four. Um, and that's our library is focused on customer service staffed by learners confidence in their abilities. And this was big for us because we really hadn't put that uh, emphasis on it before. We're really starting to see the value of how our teams work within the system. Uh, theme four, it has a great focus on who we hire, how we hire, how we train, what the expectations are on them once they're within our organization. And a lot of our people already had this mindset and this simply reinforced what they were already doing. But for some, it was new and it was a shakeup of the status quo. As an organization, we want our people to grow personally and with their passion for what we do. We're not interested in people just putting in time at a job. We want our team thriving and, and that will reflect in their attitude towards our patrons. So our new model based on the strat plan, um, we started accelerating how some things are done. We went through a lean process model for our materials handling at our admin center. Uh, we used the example of a system down in Washington State called Snow Isle. Because uh, previous to this, new material could be more than a month at our admin center while it was getting before it was getting sent out. But now we've cut that down to, in some cases, under a week. Uh, we got rid of that circulation assistant position. So in the larger branches where it was very segregated, circulation versus rep all the circulation assistants, they rolled over to be assistant community librarians, which is what they were in the smaller branches. So they're not handcuffed anymore to just title level searches. They're now able to do 90% of what can be done up at the reference desk. They're doing full subject searches, interlibrary loans, um, some tech assistance, all this different stuff that once was beyond their range. So there was a lot more job satisfaction for our people that migrated over to become assistant community librarians. They were able to really sort of see that patron through from welcoming them, getting them a card, finding material for them, helping them out with a tech question, ordering something in interlibrary loan, checking some material that we carry out to them and sending them out the door. Um, we're able to really round out that experience that they're having. Uh, we got two new technical assistant positions that focus on innovative programming for youth and adults. Right now, they are in the midst of a traveling makerspace. So they're gonna be hitting all 29 of our branches with 3D printers, uh, stuff like that, to really bring up to those smaller communities uh, some of the cool stuff that normally would only get to be in the larger system. Um, but in order to make the tech assistance possible, uh, how we were able to do that was there was a mass retirement of reference assistants. Within three months, three uh, of our reference assistants retired, and that's how we were able to fund the technical assistant. And we did a new rebranding and a new logo, because our old logo, which you're going to see in a little bit, was literally okay. Um, so we've gone a lot way there but we're still not all the way yet, there yet. We're still working on it. So when we got that new strat plan, it's this shiny, bold new vision, but it doesn't go anywhere unless the team is on board. So that team buy-in is crucial. And just a note on that, leaders within your branch, uh, within your system, 
are not just the management team or the branch heads. In every branch, there are those influencers who can make or break a new innovation. Having them on your side to help, for lack of a better term, sell the new policies and procedures is going to make it so much easier. So when we look at rolling out a new policy or if we're rolling to a new ILS, we've sort of figured out who those influencers are. Try to get them on our side first, and that way it's going to be a lot easier once we get to the, uh, to the front lines. We did need to prove that to the team that this was the new way by having those leaders set the tone. And not everybody was going to be able to make the journey. Not all were going to be able to take on the expanded role, especially those that went from uh, circ assistants to the ACLs. We did have uh, one person who was had been contemplating retirement and saw when this was coming that they decided that it was the time to retire. And it, it was a loss, but I understood it. They didn't want to learn anything new at the position or at the time of their career that they were at. But everything, every industry undergoes innovation and change. Or organizational mindset had been too stuck in the past and it needed to be shook up. And if you're not able to make that transition, then this it might not be the place where you can be. So on that shiny note, uh, why don't we take a look at why we patronize different businesses? You can break it down to four different reasons, really. There's cost, convenience, quality, and the patron experience that they have while they're there. So normally, if I do this presentation in person, I get people to sort of think about what is one organization, or one business that you frequent regularly? Uh, one that comes up a lot is uh, Walmart, the folks with the blue vests. People normally go there because of costs and convenience. Quality, it is what it is. The experience, it can be good, but sometimes it, it's not fantastic. The greeters sometimes look at you like, you owe the money. Um, it's not always fantastic. But you've probably got a restaurant that you go to where the cost is pretty good. The convenience, maybe it's a neighborhood place. The quality, you really like the food. But the experience, they treat you like family when you go in. They know your name. They know your order. Um, for myself, there's an oil change place here in town that I go back to. It's not the cheapest. It is convenient, though. They always do a great job. The quality I trust. But the experience I have when I'm there the uh, the service I get is top notch. That's why I go back there. So as a library system, what are we doing to make sure that we're trying to check off as much of the that box as we can? Cost. It's free for us. Getting a library card is free. Convenience. We have 29 branches golden down to the border. You guys have 37 locations. You've got an online presence. That's pretty convenient. Quality. We're doing what we can to make sure that our material on our stacks is in as good quality as we can. If it's not, we're going to get another copy. We don't put damaged stuff out there. And we try to be as up to date as we can with our training, with our classes, all that kind of stuff. Our patron experience, that's the big variable. It's what does the patron feel when they come into the branch? So think about it. Are you doing what you can in your location? to make sure that you're covering all these things. Our branches should be customized to reflect the design and needs of the community. The level of service by our team should be as uniform across the board as possible. So this is the result of our enhanced and ongoing training. Uh, the assistant community librarian for us that works in one branch that's open six hours per week should have the same opportunity for training as the ACL that's in a branch that's open 72 hours a week, right? Your branches, the physical layouts can be customized to reflect the different communities. What's gonna work for folks in Kelowna isn't gonna work in a community of 600, like Headley. But your patrons should still be able to get the same level of service from the team member at each of those locations. So, we took a look at a couple of things when we started looking at our teams. We changed our hiring process. Uh, first question on, I would probably guess, 90% of library 
interview questions, why do you want to work here? And I'm guessing 90% of answers is, I love books. I love to read. And that was a great answer for the traditional library service model. But what we do today is so much more than that. It's like somebody saying that they want to be a pilot because they love clouds, okay? You're going to see them, you're going to be around them, but the job is way more than that, okay? A strong customer service ethic, we weigh that more in the uh, now than we did in the past against library experience. Because if somebody has previous library experience but a poor patron service ethic, your initial training is going to be easier. They're going to understand those nuts and bolts. But trying to ingrain your own culture of service may be more difficult in the long run. And you got to think, where do you want to put that work in? In the, in the first couple of weeks when you're training them or over the year when you're trying to get out a couple of the bad habits that they might have been in? And we changed our hiring. We now hire out of a, a want base. We don't hire out of a need base. We do hiring drives uh, three to four times a year. Interview people that we think would be great fits. If it works, great. Uh, we'll put them on call. If not, then we, we're we not going to hire anybody that time. Um, if we build up enough of a backlog of auxiliary folks that are getting enough hours, we're not going to be stuck in that position where we need to hire. Okay, We want to hire the right people at the right time. We don't want to hire somebody just to have a body. We want to have the right body. And Kelowna has a number of franchises that have been ranked number one by the corporate offices. And when I go there, I have conversation with their managers about what sets them apart. What is their customer service training like? And one common theme emerged. It's hire who you want to hire, help your grandmother. Okay, That person that helps your grandmother, what do you want their attitude to be? What do you want their skill level to be? And what do you want their customer service ethic to be? Okay. How we approach training. Under the old method, it was all done in the individual branches. Okay, It'd be three, four hour shifts and circulation only. So it was very limited what we were doing. Under a new method, uh, we do majority of our training at our admin center. So Kelowna is sort of geographically center of our system. So we will bring people down from Revelstoke, Golden, bring them up from Oliver, so he's put them up in a hotel for four days, and we will give them the training there. So they get 28 hours of training at our headquarters, plus live supervised practice at a branch. While they're at our headquarters, they're going to get CERC, they're going to get basic reference, they're going to get new service programming, they're going to get uh, tech device training. Um, we really try to ing ingrain our, uh, our company customer service philosophy and the culture of who we are in the community in them at that point. Uh, it's not something that's just glossed over. It's constantly reinforced during those four days. Uh, because we think of them as an investment in our future. Uh, and talking to these people that we hire, they really appreciate the investment in them. Because we'll hear stories about people that show up at another job, they get 15 minutes of training, handed a key, and then are told that they're opening the next day. Okay. How do you think that that new employee looks at how the, uh, the company values them? Not very highly. We want to put an investment into our people, and they'll put an investment back into us. And there's been a great appreciation from our branches. When these folks that have been trained this way show up, they are literally invested in uh, what we're doing. They're, they're buying in. They're putting in their, their effort as much as they can. When we talk to the new team member, I like to stress the following things with them. That if it's within their power to fix it, they should fix it. If it's not within their power to fix, they should find out whose it is and be sure it's addressed. So not everybody has permissions to do everything. But the key is to find out who can and make sure that it's taken care of. When talking to our patrons, we always under-promise and over-deliver. The patrons will remember a broken promise more than uh, one that was carried through. Or if you exceed their expectations, they're going to remember that. Okay, And making mistakes is okay. Do not work out of an attitude of fear. Every team member was new at one time, and they all made mistakes. We still do. We're human. 
but you can't be afraid of doing that because you're not going to learn. Uh, and for our experienced team members, they need to remember that they were once not experts at what they do. Because uh, if you've ever started a new job or position and had the more experienced person get frustrated or right. angry if you made a mistake, when you were the new person, how did that feel? So we try to remind our more experienced people that they've got this coaching and mentoring role. But we let our experienced folks know that if they are working with a new hire and the new person has a, an issue, don't take over for them if it can be avoided. The new person's not going to learn unless they actually get a chance to do the task or handle the issue themselves. So if it's a hands-on computer task, have the team member, the new person, do all the keyboarding. Let them start to build up that muscle memory, but guide them through what to do as opposed to just taking over the keyboard to do it. When you look at your trainers, they have to have a passion for what they're doing. Don't make it just the most senior or most experienced person. The introduction to your system is huge and it sets the tone for the new employee's time with you. Just as a bad experience at the service desk can set the tone for future visits from a patron. Um, when you go into a place for the first time, if you have that bad experience, it, it taints your, your thought of that organization. Um, my wife and I used to have a list of businesses that we considered dead to us just because we had horrible customer service there. And within a year, all of them were gone. Okay. So make sure that you're treating that new team member the same you would a new patron. Um, make sure they feel welcome and, and know that you're there to support them. How do you keep that feeling alive for your more experienced team members? Uh, it's easy when you come into a new position and everything's shiny and new and uh, you're getting to experience the new things. But once you've been there for a while, how do you do it? So for the supervisors in the branches, know what aspect of customer service makes your team member thrive and do your best to ensure that they get to do that task as often as possible. So whether it's uh, youth service programming, tech help programming for seniors, I've got one person that just loves doing the posters on the community board. Go crazy, go for it. It's the task that needs to be doing. It's something that you like to do, take it on. So while we're on the subject of what is our passion, um, that's mine, that's my touchstone for the week. It's an organization called First Page Book Club. It's a book club we started for adults with diverse abilities. We meet once a week and it is fantastic. These are the folks that keep grounding me and reminding me why what we do is important, why what we do matters, and, and just why I love my job. So how do you check in with your folks to make sure that they're feeling as supported as they can? Here we try to do a progress check every two months. And this is different than a performance appraisal. Okay, all this is, is an unofficial, it doesn't go to headquarters, it stays in house, it's just for the supervisory team to know how the people are feeling in their position, if there's any CERC or any reference they would like more training on, where they're feeling the strongest, where they want some support, if there's any goals or programming ideas that they have in mind. Because um, we do have people that uh, are auxiliary folks, might not work that often, so there might be some things that went over in training that they're a little bit rusty on. Maybe they haven't done a corporate card in six months and they're wondering how that's done. Um, we get a lot of questions. People want more support in dealing with patrons that uh, might be having some issues that day. Um, might be having some health issues, might be having some chemical issues and they want some sort of reaffirm and, and training on that. So we go over that and we let them shadow somebody who's more uh, comfortable with dealing with that. Mark, like I said, this, yeah. Sorry, um, we've just had a couple of people who are interested in um, the slides. Would you be willing to share those after? Absolutely. Awesome. Okay, so I can definitely, um, if you send those to me, I can email them out to uh, all the attendees. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fabulous. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. Um, so with this progress check, all it is is a check, not a 
official performance appraisal, just a tool to make sure that things are going the right way and letting the team member know that they are supported. So let's talk about your culture, how you want to be seen in the uh, in the community. So best uh, analogy I can come up with is Starbucks. And like them or not, Starbucks are, are everywhere. And you can get the same cup of coffee in over 20,000 locations. But on the left-hand side, that's a cup from the Starbucks Reserve Roastery. And right now, I think they've only got two or they might have opened three locations on the planet. There's a couple more coming. But the people there have a passion for what they do. They've got one in Seattle, and I was fortunate enough to go there earlier this year. Their training program is phenomenal. The first two weeks of training is just on their corporate culture, what they do, why they do it, what their philosophies are. Agree with them, don't agree with them, but they're really ingraining this in their team. Uh, for the next month, they shadow somebody before they're able to work on their own. And the service and the passion the team in this location had was second to none. You walk in, you're greeted uh, warmly and genuinely. Um, and the people know their stuff. Uh, the one guy in the bakery spent about 10 minutes going all over all the different uh, pastries and baked goods that he has. And people apply to work in this location from all over the states. Okay, so that if you've got a real passion, this is this is where you're going to go. Now, when you think about it, when we talk to our new hires, is would you rather have that kind of service that you would get at a strip mall, Starbucks, or would you rather have the experience of going to the location where the service was different than anywhere else, uh, where they could go above and beyond? And as a patron, what's going to build your loyalty? That strip mall location or, and you can do fantastic service in a strip mall, but you've got to set yourself apart. You've really got to put in the effort for the patron service. You've got to let them know that they're, that they're wanted. And this is something that I talked about before is that your tone and culture are not just set by the management team. Okay. That drive for patron service can be done by those influencers within the branch. That part-time team member who's only in six days a week but looked up to can really set an example and set the tone for the culture in their branch as much as the CEO. Um, so how do we get feedback from our frontline teams on what the direction we should be going with different policies are? And on a different topic, I was speaking with Sarah Gillis, uh, who's manager of community engagement at Halifax Public Library, and she shared a program that she did. Uh, we called it T-Bar. Today I bent a rule. And what this was, was a two-week trial that we asked our teams to submit to uh, an anonymous email what rules they were bending in the name of patron service. And I know, I'm sure everybody in Marigold follows the rules completely, never bends any policy, anything like that. But here we found, especially as you get further out a little bit geographically, uh, that rules were getting bent. And if they're getting bent consistently, it's probably for a good reason. And if it's a good reason, maybe we need to look at the policy around that rule. So two week trial, tracking where most of the rules were bent. Uh, and it was anonymous. We've got an intranet and there was just a submission button there, so we didn't track emails, anything like that. Occasionally, somebody would put their name to it. Most people didn't, but it really let us see trends and service gaps. It was not a license to throw out the policy manual, though. So this wasn't a, an encouragement to go and break rules. This was just, why are you currently bending them? And it was a way for our frontline team members to have some input on future policy. We did ask for some information to be included on the when they submitted what they did. What policy they bent, why they bent it, how did it improve patron service, and what is a suggested change to policy. So this was a, a typical response that we got back. So the person submitted that they work in a one-person library where they know many of the patrons, and I love that about our smaller community branches, is that you do get that chance to really know your community. 
uh, and give them service on a different level sometimes than you can do in the larger locations. But somebody comes in without their library card, it's Bill, you know Bill, he lives two houses down from you. Uh, our policy is if you don't have your card, you have to have some identification. So this person just looks them up um, by their name, confirms the information, and checks the stuff out. So didn't have identification with them. So she says that they wouldn't do that in a, in a larger location, but thinks that it's okay to do in a smaller branch where she knows the patrons well. And I get that. It'd be ridiculous if my aunt came in, didn't have her card with her, and I said, no, sorry, Auntie Donna, you've got to go back up to the car. Okay. So that was one of the kinds of things that we got in. And we found three major areas of concern that came in. One, uh, picking up holds for a partner without their card. Uh, two, not being able to renew feature films and setting pins for patrons. So our cards aren't linked. If Bill comes in to pick up his partner Mary's card or material and he doesn't have her card, he's not gonna be able to pick it up. So we went to key set cards. They've got one major lar uh, larger card part, two smaller key tag portions. So Mary can give Bill one of those. Bill can come in and check out Mary's stuff. So we address that one. For the feature films, uh, unable to be renewed, we proposed to the board, and I think it got put in front of them last board meeting, I'm not sure how that washed out, that feature films should be able to be renewed. Our feature films go for seven days, let's be able to renew it for another seven days. Our collection has grown a lot since we first got them, so it's not quite the, the issue that it was once upon a time. And pins for our patrons. When we were registering patrons, we would tell them that we give them a default uh, password of one, two, three, four for their account and show them where the pack was in the branch that they can change it or recommend that they can change it online. We found that nobody was doing it. If somebody came in to try to use self-check and didn't know what their pin was, if we typed in one, two, three, four, 90% of the time it was gonna work. So that's not real secure. So we got little just pin pads at each of our desks that cost 10 bucks a piece and it solved that issue. So the nice thing was, as these uh, areas of concern came up, we were able to start to address them and start to make some actual changes for it. And it's important uh, that you communicate to the teams what the, change, what the uh, results were of the T-bar and how you're addressing them and let them know the follow through so that they know it's not just a futile exercise. Okay, so they were able to suggest policy changes. And how else do we get our frontline team to start to improve patron experience? Well, here, we're trying to not anchor to the desk anymore. Um, there's a bad habit of people sitting down at a chair at a desk and not getting up from it. So we are encouraging if a patron comes in and they're asking where a certain section is or a certain item is, that team member getting up, going away from the desk, getting somebody to cover the desk though, and showing that patron where the item is on the shelf because it gives you that opportunity to open up a larger conversation with some of the other things we might carry. We've also started going with uniform wayfinding. So when you go into a branch, you can see, you know, if you visit one of our smaller branches, one of our larger branches once upon a time, you were gonna see three or four different kinds of signs, different fonts, different layouts, all that. We're really moving more to a uniform system um, so that patrons get used to looking for one particular um, thing. It's not a variety of signage. They can find the fiction sign, the nonfiction sign. They can read on the posters quickly where something is going to be happening. We got real vigilant on graffiti. Um, using that broken window philosophy for maintenance, we take care of the small issues before they become big issues. Uh, we did a uh, contest in one of our branches to start upselling our services. Uh, we got a little prize and just encouraged uh, our frontline team to see who could get the most DVDs checked out. And not popular ones, but like the, the stuff that sits on the shelf for a bit. So team went and got each picked up a basket of DVDs. And whenever a patron came up to the desk and was checking something out, 
if they had a DVD that was even tangentially related to what the patron was checking out, it's, oh, have you seen this? Did you know we had DVDs on this subject as well? Um, and they started upselling our services. So now what we train in our folks is if somebody comes up and they're checking out a travel book on Japan, we let them know. Did you know you also get so many hours of Rosetta Stone training with your library card? We've got a great online database called Global Road Warrior that has up-to-date current travel information on all these different places. So really expanding uh, what the patron can do with our services that they might not have known that they could do. We became the experts at it. And for our branches, we don't have on-site janitorial services. So it falls on the teams to perform the smaller cleaning duties. So that's the, the broom and the dustpan there. And department's head started by setting the example, um, picking up the paper, sweeping. And what it did was it showed that nobody is above doing it. And what started to happen was we wouldn't have to ask anybody to do it because the model had already been set. They'd already seen that this was something that they could be doing, they should be doing, and they started doing it. And a side benefit of it was uh, interior health for British Columbia built a new office building next to our branch. And 400 new employees that hadn't worked in the downtown core are now working there. So I timed when I'd be sweeping up outside to when they were all arriving for work. So I was able to say hi, sort of talk to them, welcome to them to the neighborhood and see if they had library cards, encourage them to come back, talk about some of the different things that we had going on. So it sort of became a, a dual purpose. We were able to do some promotion, but also make sure that our environment looked as welcoming as possible. So from sweeping up and making it look as welcoming as possible, how does your patrons see you? So exercise, do with the group when I do the presentation, is to close your eyes and walk through the worst possible library experience that you can imagine. So actually go ahead and do it. Close your eyes, start outside the branch. So you park the car, you're walking up to the front, and you're taking your first looks at the library. Uh, what do the windows look like? Um, what about the signs? How's the entranceway? How are the doors? You go through the door. You look around. And what do you notice? How are the staff? What's the signage like? Would you say that it's light and bright or is it dark and dreary? What's the cleanliness like? Do you want to go into the public restroom there? What are the, what are the stacks like? Do things look like they're in order? Does it look neat? Does it look tidy? Okay. So you have that image in your mind and now clear that image out. So I'm going to guess when you went there that the windows were dark. There was nothing happening behind them. Uh, when you got there, signs on the door, maybe in four or five different kinds of signs, letting you know that you're going to be closed this holiday, our open hours, this event is happening, torn, tattered, things weren't looking that good. When you walked in, were you greeted? Did anybody look like they were happy to see you there? Were you welcomed? Was it dirty? Was it dark? Flooring was dirty. Shelves looked like a mess. There was nobody to ask for help. Okay. Now, close your eyes once again. And let's go through the best possible library experience you can imagine. So just like you did before, you've parked the car, you're walking to the front door. What's your first impression when you look through the windows? When you go to the entrance, when you walk through the door? When you look around, what do you notice? Okay, how are the staff? What's the signage like? Is it light and bright, dark and dreary, and is it clean? And what we've tried to do here is engineer the best possible experience we can for our patients by going through this exercise. So for us right now, at the Kelowna branch in particular, when you walk up, we've activated our windows as much as possible. 
We've got some really cool soft furnishings for kids over in our children's section by the windows. We've got puzzle tables by the windows. We've got um, different activities that people can be doing there. When you walk through the door, our signage on the door, it's not torn. We've laminated stuff so it doesn't get that tattered appearance. It's uniform. It's, it's the same format. Uh, when you walk in, we're trying to get our patron or our team to do uh, something that we learned about from Disney World. They've got something called the 510 rule. That 10 feet away from a team member, you should be getting a visual acknowledgement of that you're there. Within five feet, you should be getting a verbal acknowledgement. So you don't have to say hi to everybody that comes in the door because you're going to go crazy if you do that. But with the people walking in the door, are you looking up from what you're doing to make sure that you've acknowledged that they're there, that they know that there's somebody they can make eye contact with and come over for help? Um, we've really gone through a, a big physical renovation here. So it is a lot more light. It's bright. And we're on top of the cleanliness ourselves. Even though we don't have on-site janitorial, we're doing what we can within reason to make sure things are as welcoming as possible. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit now about the Kelowna branch. It was a flagship location, they called it, that was open back in 96. And as soon as we moved in, circulation dropped. We had no free parking, no residential base closed by. Uh, we weren't on a bus. There was no bus stop outside. We're in the downtown core, and there was a perceived issue with the transient population. Uh, at the same time as we moved shortly thereafter, another branch moved and revitalized in the city with free parking and a community center that had a sports field and ice rinks. So that's where people were going to go. And as I mentioned before, very limited programming. Focus on book club and children's programs, and that's it. So it was a large location built for us to grow into, but as Cirque declined and the building wasn't being used to its fullest. So a company bought the vacant lot next door to the library from the city, and the city as part of the agreement with them selling it was that we were going to be joined to them. It's the innovation center, so there's a lot of business startups, a lot of uh, tech companies sort of going in there. And that sparked a revitalization of the Kelowna branch. So we had two years of construction and interruption. Uh, they had to literally jackhammer, I'm using literally way too much. They had to jackhammer bricks off the side of our building. So there was that noise going on. Um, we lost all the windows on one side. There was a fence around the building for the better part of two years. Uh, so the entranceway was, became very narrow. People thought we were closed. So there was a big downside to this. But the upside was, it invigorated our system to look at the branch and re envision how we could use it. So we did a bunch of different things. Uh, we moved to mobile shelving on our first floor. We closed for a month solid to redo floors, to take out some big concrete walls. We moved our desk, our first floor service desk, out from the wall and made it into an island in the middle so it was far more approachable. Our old branch, this is how it was before. Uh, we had some horrible green carpet that started ripping not long after we opened in 1996. Uh, the glue would come loose underneath, it would bubble. And we tried to hide it by using duct tape as close to that color as we could. Uh, after a while, we just started embracing the ugly and used the wildest color duct tape we could. Um, the signage wasn't uniformed, it was cramp. It wasn't just, it was, wasn't real bright. So we did the renovations. We got new rubberized resilient flooring. Uh, we use mobile shelving now so we can host all these different events. Uh, we took advantage of new tools and updated our collections at the same time. We had a whole wall of phone books. Uh, we got rid of it and then we have a designated uh, tablet with Canada 411 and postal codes on it. And it's used more, it takes up a lot less space. Then we're moving towards the uniform wayfinding. And just a quick shot of our children's area before. Once again, had that horrible green carpet, no uniform signage. And we cleared up a lot of space around the windows and really brightened it up a lot. We have 
much more meeting room space now. We're doing fundraising right now for a media lab. Um, we can host events from two people to 300 people. Uh, so we're really becoming more of a, a meeting space in the downtown area. And because we were able to refresh our branch, we're doing things like hosting different galas. We had uh, Stone Soup, which raised uh, money for uh, an organization that funds some libraries in Africa. It was very cool and not something we would have been able to do before under either our old mindset or before we did our renovation. Hi, Mark. Sorry, yeah. we just have a question here. Um, yeah. The question is, what do you use for the Canada 411 portal? I believe you said it was a tablet? Yeah. Yeah, it's a tablet on a stand. Um, does that answer the question uh, out there? Awesome. Thanks, Mark. No problem. Yeah, it, it was a really cool way to um, free up. I think there was six bays of phone books before. Saved a lot of space. We became a victim of our own success, though, with all that meeting room space. We actually had to suspend public bookings for four months because we had such a demand on the room and a lack of staffing at the time that we were able to handle it for a few different reasons that we wanted to make sure we were still able to put out the same quality of program and same quality of uh, availability to the public. So at one point we said, we just can't do any more until after April. And that was okay. So on a typical Tuesday, we can have up to 16 different events happening in the library. For a service desk um, downstairs, I mentioned that we moved it out away from the wall. Uh, we went to self pickup of polls. We pushed for our patrons to use self check stations. We started at less than 5%. We're now sitting at about 50%. And we've got that new one stop service model uh, since we went to the ACL program. So people are able to go to that desk and get 90% of their needs met. Uh, we've got the new meeting room stuff, the new tech assistance, and our programming exploded um, when we started doing this from back in 2012. Uh, we're up 79%. We had over uh, 5,000 programs run in 2017 system-wide. Uh, I think in 2017, we had just shy of 50,000 people attend programs. Uh, that's just here in the Cologne branch. The Peachland problem. So we were able to shut down and fund uh, the renovations in Kelowna all at once. You're not always able to do that. Sometimes you've got to take the opportunities to, to fix things up as you can. I mentioned before, our old logo was just okay. That's it. Okay. And if you, I don't know if you can make it out, but just behind the little guy with the book, up above to the left, that's a cassette tape. So very backwards, very outdated logos. And this is our Peachland branch. And eventually, half the sign fell off. And did we take that opportunity to fix it? No, we waited. Okay, so we went from being okay to just oh. And the part that remained, sadly, was the most outdated part. Okay, and then April 5th, 2017, a patron drove through the front of the Peachland branch. Uh, six people were taken to the hospital, all recovered, but it keyed um, what I like to call Christ attunity. Look on the bright side, Dad. Did you know that the Chinese use the same word for crisis as they do for opportunity? Yes, right, the Trinity. You're right. All right, so what we learned was to take care or take advantage of crisis opportunity when it presented itself. You can't do a complete system wide rebrand, updating logo, signage, because the budget doesn't allow. It's a huge cost. Do it when you can. Look for those opportunities, but keep moving towards the goal. So when it all goes right, what is the payoff? What happens when somebody has a great experience? Um, this card came into us uh, last summer. Uh, Ms. Parvin brought it in. She wanted to know if her card was still good. So I don't know if you can make out the expiration date up there in the top right-hand corner of the card. It's March 86. Ms. Parvin used to come in and bring her kids for story time when they were younger. The kids grew up, started going to school. They didn't come to story time anymore. The kids moved away. Kids now have their own kids, so 
that summer, Hartman remembered as the grandkids came to visit the great time her kids had at summer reading club. So Miss Parvin brought them in to get um, them signed up for summer reading club and wanted to know if her card was still good. Okay, she had such a great experience back then that almost you know 30 years later, 31 years later, that stuck with her and she came back because she knew what the experience was when she was here and how much it meant to her kids. So. Just keep that in mind when you're dealing with the public, when you're talking to your teams as they're dealing with the public, is that you don't know how big of an impact that they're going to make. And if they do all that they can to make sure that the patron experience is worth it, is as good as it can be, the payoff might not be immediate. It might take 31 years later, but it is going to come back. People will remember the good experience they had. And folks, that is my presentation. I think you got about two minutes left on your clock. Um, I don't want to go over, but if anybody's got any time, uh, questions that were not addressed, I'm more than happy to talk about them now. Thanks, Mark. That was really great. Um, I'll just keep my eye out here, see if any questions uh, are going to come in. Sure. And I will forward the, uh, the slides to you. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. No problem. Okay, nothing coming in so far. Okay, if you have questions, anybody, just use that uh, questions chat box that's on your toolbar. Oh, here we go. Uh, what was the security pilot project? The security pilot project was, it started with two of our largest branches. We got funding for, it started, I believe, 12 hours a week. Uh, then as, and this was a couple of years ago, as the opioid crisis in BC increased, um, our security concerns and some of our larger branches increased as well. So back in, I believe it was October, we went before the library board and got emergency funding for full-time security for all open branches um, for the two big branches, Vernon and Kelowna that have the most security issues. Uh, we got full-time security for them as a pilot project. And at our last board meeting, it was just uh, approved to become a permanent budget item. So in the Kelowna and Vernon branches, we will have full-time security. Because they had to look at what is the cost of the security but what is the cost of the different team members that are having to go and spend their day dealing with this? Because sometimes I could spend three hours a day uh, being a library policeman and patrolling bathrooms, checking the shelves, waking up to this person doing this. Um, so now I'm able to, and the other team members are able to concentrate on the job that they're, that they're should be getting paid for. Thank you. Any other questions, anybody? Okay, um, it doesn't look like we've got any other questions coming in. So um, I'll let everybody know this session is being recorded um, and I will send out an email that lets you know when the recording's available. Um, yeah, thank you, Mark, for, for doing this for us, long distance. <laughs> No worries. Uh, I'm happy if you want, when you send out the notice that the presentation's out and available to be, be, be viewed, um, feel free to put my email address on that in case anybody does have any follow-up. Awesome. Fabulous. Thank you so much. No trouble at all. Excellent. Thanks for joining us today, everybody. Have a Thank great you day. Guys, thanks for spending your, your time with me today.